Thank you, church. May, be, may Jesus Christ be praised. And this morning, we'll continue with our series in the book of Psalm, and uh, we'll study Psalm 5, and you will find it on page 533. And last week, we studied Psalm 3, and we saw how David was weeping with his head covered, but he took refuge in God's sovereignty. He knows that the Lord will very soon lift his head up in, in joy and thanksgiving. So his faith enabled him to lie down. And David was not depending on his troops or his counselors that he had planted to mislead Absalom or any military strategy. And rather, he acknowledges that any victory will uh, would come from God and God alone. And he closed this limit psalm by this final request, your blessing be upon your people. And that was Psalm 3. And this morning, as I said, we'll, we'll look at Psalm 5. And uh, we don't know exactly when David wrote it. And since it, it happens just after Psalms 3 and 4, and which were written in conjunction with Absalom rebellion, it may have been written at the same time. Some commentators uh, suggest that David could have written it as he re uh, reflected back on the years that he, he ran for, for his life from King Saul. And others believe it was composed by David in the wilderness when Absalom's forces for, uh, sought to destroy him in 2 Samuel chapter 15 to uh, 18. So whatever the situation and with the words that David used, we can see that David's enemies were wicked and evil. And throughout the first, the second, the third, and fourth Psalms, you will have noticed that the, the subject is a contrast between the position and the character of the righteous and of the wicked. In the psalm, the psalm that we will look at this morning, Psalm 5, you will note the same thing. And the psalmist carries out a contrast between himself, made righteous by God's grace, and the wicked who opposed him. And David offered prayers he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. Psalm 5 is divided into two parts, and from the first to seven and verse, uh, you have the first part, and then from the eighth to the twelfth, you have the second part. In the, in the first part of the psalm, David fervently pleads with the Lord to listen to his prayer. And in the second part, he returns to the same ground. And let's look at first verse 1. And listen to my words, Lord, consider my limit. And listen to my cry, my Lord, for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. And this prayer begins with three imperatives. You see, uh, first, give Give ear to my words, and second, consider my groanings, my sighing, my lament, and third, listen to my cry. And this do not represent that uh, a fear on the psalmist's part that God will not hear his prayer, but instead it's a Hebrew parallelism. And let's observe the word, the order and force. Of the, of the words, the verse one, my cry, the voice of my prayer, and also give ear, consider, and listen. And all these expressions reveal the urgency and, and energy of uh, David's feelings and petitions. First we have give ear, as I said, that is heal me. But it is a, of a little use of, for the words to be heard unless the cry or the roaring or the meditation 
be considered. And the second part of verse 1, consider my meditation. So that means if I have asked what is right, give it to me. If I have omitted to ask what, what I most needed, fill up the, vac the vacancy in my prayer. Consider my groanings, my meditation. And we got it in your wisdom and give thoughts to it. Judge of my sincerity and of the true state of my necessities and answer me in due time for your mercy's sake. This is exactly what David is saying in verse 1. And the Hebrew word used in verse, for sighing in verse 1 means both to pray and to, to meditate. And one theologian puts it this way, meditation is the best beginning of prayer, and prayer is the best conclusion of meditation. End of quote. And as an example, we have David, we have Daniel. Daniel, he, he has first opened up his soul to meditate, then he kneeled down to pray. In verse 1, David used prayer in threefold form. We'll, we'll, we'll see that. He used first words, meditation, and cry. And then it is to show us that expression is useless without a heart. But fervent and silent desires are accepted, even they are not, they are not expressed. And the normal response, don't, don't, don't forget, David is under attack. The context is, he is under attack, and people were after him. And the normal response for us when we are attacked is to fight back immediately. So if someone insults us, we are thinking of a better insult to hurl back at him, and we hardly let him stop speaking before we let it fly. But David didn't do that. Look at what he said. He took his complaint to the Lord in honest, personal, persistent, expectant prayer. God knows everything about us, so it's ridiculous to try to hide our feelings from him. And as Psalm 68, 62 verse 8 exhorts, trust in him at all times. O oh, people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us, so pray honestly even you are groaning, even you are sighing, even you don't have any words. Exactly what David is saying here. Sometimes he doesn't have any words, but he just sighing before the Lord. And notice the, uh, the, the parallelism of titles. He used O Yahweh, the personal covenant name of God, in Exodus 14, verse 3, when God revealed himself to Moses. He said, O Yahweh, my king, the king of the universe, my God. And in the Old Testament, we have several forms of, 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 uh, of the term of God. We have El, hello, him, hello, uh, and which all based on El, which denotes power and strength. And he used that in, in, in poi on poetry. Um, all, all, all those terms are interchangeable. So he used, O oh Lord, O oh Yahweh, O oh my God, and he said, you, uh, listen, you listen to my cry for help. And you notice carefully this little possessive pronouns. It is, it's my God, my king. Even though David was a king, he knew that he only served under a far greater king, the Lord God. 
O Lord, O my King, my God. And it seems that David knew God personally as my King and my God. It was the close relationship with God. He was not a stranger in God's presence. And let me give you a wonderful argument why God should answer prayer. Because he's our king, he's our God. We are not aliens to him. He's the king of our hearts. And kings are expected to heal the appeals of their own people. And we are not strangers to him. We are his worshipers, and he is our God, by covenant, by promise, by oath, and by blood. The, son, the blood of his son shed on the cross. So we are his subjects. He is our king. So he should listen to us. And prayer should be personal, intimate relationship between you and your God. And what I really want you to show here, David, he was one, one of the most powerful men on earth. He was the king. He said, my king. See the, you, the humility. He said, my king and my God. And he came before the Lord as his subjects. And you, you must come before him as your king, the Lord of your life. And you cannot pray rightly unless you are submissive to do his will. Because if he's the king, so you, the, the direct relationship is to submit to do his will. And you must know him as your Lord and Savior, who invites you to come into his presence through the blood of Jesus. In verse 2, for to you I pray. And here David expresses his declaration that he will see God and God alone. And God should be the only object of worship and the only resource of our soul in times of need. For to you I pray. And he makes a, a resolution that as long as I live, I will pray. And he says, I will never cease to supplicate, to beg, even if the answer did not come. Let's see, in the, let's look at verse 3. In the morning, O oh Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. And this, this psalm and, and it, it indicates a morning prayer. And uh, don't forget for post-exilic Jews, there were several times to, uh, a day when prayers uh, were offered and we have uh, at, at the time of morning sacrifice, uh, about th nine in the morning, nine a.m., and then you have at noon, and lastly at the time of the evening sacrifice at three. So nine in the morning at noon, and three in the uh, three in the in the afternoon. So in the morning I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. And the Hebrew has a still for a fuller meaning than this. It's a, the Hebrew word is I will direct my prayer. I will put them. In order. And uh, this verb has a wide and semantic field, but it basically means to arrange something, to put something in order. Here it could be words or sacrifice, and eagerly watch. It doesn't only put them in order, but you see, he's watching in expectation. He expects to have something. And, and this indicates uh, expected waiting for something. And he expects Yahweh to respond to, to his prayer. It's like a child 
waiting for Christmas. We are in January, but he is still waiting for the next Christmas. So he's waiting, he's watching. And he says, I will expect that the blessing shall come. This is exactly, this is a very great picture as we believers, when we pray, we expect to have something. We don't know when it will come, but we expect to have something. We are watching. We know that he is merciful. We know that he loved us. We know that he has a loving kindness, but in his abundant mercy, we know that he will answer to us. It will, it will give us what we need. And David's first thought, and look at this, in the morning, and David's first thought on waking was about the threat of these evil enemies. So he's waking up and immediately turned those thoughts into prayer. Sometimes when we wake up and we have all kind of thought in, in, in our head and we don't know what to do, immediately what David did, he turned those thoughts into prayer. And let me encourage you, when you wake up tomorrow and during the week, turn to the Lord every thought that you have into prayer. In honest, personal, persistent prayer. And regardless of the trials in your lives, and turn, turn them into prayer. And Charles Spurgeon quotes, and prayer should be the key of the day and the luck of the night. As a believer, we need to use that key every morning and every night. And wait in expectation it applies that when we pray, as I said, we should look for, for the answer. As our king, we can expect God to listen and respond to our needs as his subjects. So when, when you are under attack, take refuge in the Lord through prayer. And sometimes... We often rush into the presence of God without forethought or humility. We are like men or women who present themselves before a king without a petition. And in the ancient time, when you want to see the king, you need to have a petition. You need to have a request. And then the, the, the person before, he, to let you see the king, you, he will take your request and then he will invite you to see the king. So you come prepared. This is exactly the same image. So when you go before the Lord, you come prepared and you know, and as David did, he arranged his thoughts before giving uh, to the Lord what he wants to, what the Lord wants to do for him. So we, no wonder, we, we often miss the reason for our prayer. Sometimes we pray today and then we forget. And we go another day, we ask another, th we ask another thing. But we should be careful to keep the stream of meditation always running, preparation. And always pray with fervency and with preparation. In verses four and six, the psalmist describes God and you have how he did describe God. And not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. It's exactly what James said in James 1 verse 17. Every good gift, every good and perfect gift comes from God. And, and thirdly, the arrogant will not stand before your eyes. You hate, you hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak false word. And six, you abhor the men of bloodshed and deceit. And you see in verse five, you hate. And this is shocking to us that Yahweh, the king of universe, the desire of fellowship with all humans, hates. And the Bible uses terms uh, we call anthropomorphism to describe the deity, to describe God. And this always causes tensions 
but that doesn't sound like God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. So does, but the question is, does God love the sinner or hate him? And doesn't the Bible say that he loves the whole world? So what does that mean that here, David is saying that God hates? And first, what it, mean, what it means by that, it means his love for those made in his image causes the opposite reaction when they treat each other in destructive ways. The opposite reaction. And second, when David says that God doesn't take pleasure in wickedness, it's a figure of, of speech to say, literally, he hates sinners. And God hates all who do, who do wrong. He repeated it again. God hates all who do wrong. And it is the Hebrew word, netha, which means to hate. Literally, God hates sinners. And you see how the Lord's alienation from the wicked, it said for gradually, you see that in verse 4, first, he has no pleasure in them. And secondly, they shall not dwell with them. And thirdly, he cast them forth. They shall not stand in his sight. And fourthly, his heart turns from them. You hate all the workers of iniquity. And fifthly, his, stand, his hand is turned upon them. You shall destroy them who speak lies. And sixthly, he says, his spirit rises against them and is alienated from them. The Lord will abhor the bloody men. So observe that evil speakers must be punished. As well as evil workers. For you shall destroy those who tell lies. It's pretty really clear. All liars shall have their portion in the lake which burns with fire. A man may lie without danger of the law of men, but he will not escape the law of God. And let me tell you, sometimes we need the verses about God's hatred of sinners so that we will be overwhelmed with how terrible and offensive our sin is to an absolutely holy God. Only then will we properly appreciate that what he did for us in Christ. And God loved us even he hated us. And he hated us for our sin and rebellion. But he loved us in Christ before the foundation of the world. This is exactly what David, David meant by God hates sinners. And you see in verse 7, in contrast to the faithless follower, the psalmist knows that because of Yahweh's great mercy, and it's a very interesting word, uh, abundant loving kindness, Merciful kindness, he will worship him in the temple in reverence. And the Hebrew word and translated loving kindness, we have uh, many translations, is the, 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 the Old Testament word for grace. Loving kindness, abundant kindness, abundant mercy, merciful, merciful kindness. And perhaps and David's phrase, abundant loving kindness, is, is where Paul got his phrase, you, you know, in Ephesians 5, 1, the riches of his grace. And I love that. But the only way that anyone can draw near to God is, is through his abundant grace, as shown to us in Christ. Because he's merciful. And David says, I will not come there by on my, my own merit. No, I have a multitude of sins, and therefore I will come in the multitude of your mercy. 
and I will approach you with confidence because of your immeasurable grace. And God's judgment, God's judgments are numbered, but his mercies are countless. He gives his wrath by weight, but his mercy without weight. So you can always approach God with confidence because of his multitude of mercy. And David didn't trust his own righteousness to approach God because he knows that we can only come into his presence by his grace as we trust in Christ. But at the same time, before we condemn as sinners those attacking us, we need to take the log out of our own eye. You see in verse, now we're on verse 10. We, we will go to verse 10. And the, the psalmist will, will, will condemn those who were wicked. So before we do that, we need to ask ourselves, what about me? Am I, am I judging my own sins and obeying Christ? Are they arrogant or hateful or dishonest? And what about me? While I can appeal to God to bring justice, at the same time, I need to examine my own heart. Now we come to the, the second part of the psalm, verse 8. And you will see the, the psalmist will repeat his argument and goes over and over to the, the, same, the same ground again. And lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make straight your way before me. And he wants to show us, to say, O Lord, lead, lead me as a little child is led by his father. As a blind man guided by his friend. Beloved friends, it is safe and pleasant walking when God leads the way. In your righteousness, see what David says, in your righteousness, not in my righteousness. Because my, right, my righteousness is not perfect. It's, it is imperfect. But in yours, for you are righteousness itself. In my, not in my righteousness, in your righteousness. Make your way, not my way, straight before my face. Again, brothers, when we have learned to give up our own, own way and long to walk in God's way, it is a happy sign of grace. And it is no small mercy to see the way of God with clear vision straight before our face. And mistakes about duty may lead us into a sea of sins before we know where we are. But God's guidance is needed always and especially when enemies are attacking us, are watching us, when strong temptations surround us to take a shortcut, or when nobody is watching us. We're always tempted to, to take the shortcut. But God's guidance is always needed. God's guidance is always best. And he says, and I will paraphrase it, his prayer, you see in verse, in verse 8, it's not a prayer that God would protect him from the wicked. Not only that, he asked for, for, the, for protection, but see, but also that God would protect him from becoming like the wicked. But because David knows how easy it is to fall. It's, it's very easy to become like the wicked. He said, Lord, not only to protect me, but also to protect me from becoming like the wicked. 
So he asked God to show him his way. You see the difference? He could say, Lord, this is my way. This is what, where I want to go. But he did not do that. He, say, he said, Lord, I really want you to lead me in my righteousness because I don't want to fall and to become like the wicked. And it is, it is not necessarily wrong to defend yourself against critics that attack you. It's not wrong because Paul did that in Galatians and in 2 Corinthians, but it requires God's wisdom to know when to defend yourself and when to ignore critics. And whatever you do, it takes God's grace and wisdom to respond in a gracious, Christ-like manner. And verse 9, you see now the psalmist is concerned about the words and deeds of his enemies. And you, and verse, and you see, and first, there is nothing reliable, true, in what they say. And second, their inward parts are destruction itself. And third, their throat is an open grave. How dangerous it is when you have an open grave. You could see it's a very dirty smell. It smells very bad. And it's just so with the throat of the wicked. It's, the, it's a figure of, of speech graphically portrays the filthy conversation of the wicked. And verse 10, declare them guilty. Oh God, let, let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. And now the psalmist, now he speaks as an official judge. He speaks as God's mouth and by condemning the wicked. And he gives us no excuse for pronouncing anything cursing on those who have caused, caused us a personal offense. And you see, you notice that. He said, they, they have rebelled against you. It's not, he, he didn't say they have rebelled against, against me. This is a very important uh, uh, remark. He could say, you know, I'm the king, and they have rebelled against me. And do something. He said, no, no, you, they have rebelled against you. And notice the different words that the, the, the psalmist used, that David used, to describe the enemies. In verse four, they are wicked, boastful, arrogant, doers of iniquity in verse five, speak false word in verse six, men of bloodshed, verse six, men of deceit, foes in verse eight, nothing reliable, attitude of destruction. See, those words that he used to describe, and they are liars, transgressors, rebellious, and he used those words to describe them. But you see, and, and that's why I said, before you pray verses 9 and 10 against your critics, you need to remember that Paul cited these verses as an indictment against the sinfulness of everyone in Romans 3 verse 13. So even though we have been redeemed, we have still to fight against our old nature, which is prone to all the sins. So before you say, oh, da, 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 so you go back and you see the, the sins that uh, David described, liars, transgressions, and rebellious. If you, let's say, if you saw that you, you didn't do those sins, it's okay. So you can boastfully and say, okay, I'm pure. But even you say that I'm, I'm boastful, I'm arrogant, that would, you will fall into the, the, the category of arrogant. And verse 10, let all those who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. In contrast, in the last part in the psalm, the psalmist now describes the faithful followers and then the, their experience with the Lord. And they take refuge in Yahweh. They rejoice in Yahweh. They take shelter in him. They love and exalt his name. In light of this 
Yahweh, God, shelters them, blesses them, surrounds them as a shield. And let me conclude with this. And joy is the privilege of the believer. When sinners are destroyed, our rejoicing shall be full. The laugh first and weep after. But we weep now, but shall rejoice eternally. And as the most grown forever, so shall we ever shout for joy. Our joy has a firm foundation because we are joyful in the Lord. The eternal God is the wellspring of our joy. And we love God, therefore we delight in him. Our heart is at ease in our God. And we eat lavishly every day because we feed on him. We have music in the house, music in the heart, music in heaven, for the Lord Jehovah is our strength and our song. He also has become our salvation. And you see in verse 11 and 12, the character of the righteous, faith and love, and the privileges of the righteous, joy, great, pure, triumphant, and defense by power, providence and grace. Joy in the Lord is both a duty and a privilege. You, Lord, will bless the righteous. It's a promise of an infinite length, unlimited width, and an inexpressible preciousness. David is saying that the believer can be joyful even when under attack because the, the Lord, the shield of God's favor surrounds him. Paul and Silas knew that joy when they sang praises to God from the Philippian jail after being wrongly accused and beaten. And do you know that joy when you are under attack? It is found in God as, a, as your refuge and righteous defender. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you for your word and thank you for being a shield, righteous defender, our God, our protector. And we thank you for the joy that we found in you. We thank you for the joy of salvation. And we thank you, Lord, for all you have done for us. Help us to keep those words into our hearts as we go through this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.